Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. Well, the decision's been a long time coming, but finally the United States, Germany and other European nations will now send battle tanks to Ukraine. Well, President Zelensky heard some of that news while speaking to Sky's Kay Burley earlier. And with the Russian offensive expected in the spring, the question now is whether it will be enough. Well, back at home, Nadim Zahawi is still in his job, despite paying millions in back taxes and a penalty to HMRC. But he might not feel any more secure after today's PMQs. We'll talk scandal and substance as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. Leopard 2 tanks are coming from Europe. You must be relieved. Uh, ah, Shoyna. Scholz? Tylko co? No, u mnie z Scholzem będzie rozmowa zaraz. Prezesekretarz powiedział, że Shoyna Scholz, kanclerz Scholz, potwierdził, że da. Well, that was the moment. President Zelensky speaking to our own Kay Burley in Kyiv today as he heard the news of 14 German tanks on the way and later another 30 from the US were announced. We'll play more of that interview in this programme, but back in the comments. He can't even deal with tax avoiders in his own cabinet. Yeah. Is he starting to wonder if this job is just too big for him? Yeah. See what he was doing there. Uh, no surprises, Keir Starmer focusing on Nadim Zahawi at PMQs today. This was Rishi Sunak's response. When anti-Semitism ran rife, yeah. when his predecessor sided with our opponents, that's what's weak, Mr Speaker. He has no principles and just petty politics. Well, there were plenty of other very important questions raised, which we will cover this evening, not least the state of the probation service in this country and hundreds of missing asylum-seeking children. On the programme today, we are going to be talking to the Working Pension Secretary, Mel Stride. From Labour, we'll talk to the Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Kyle. And we'll be talking to the former Police Chief Constable and Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, Dame Sarah Thornton, plus much more, much more besides on the take. Hello, good evening. Well, it's another very significant day in the war in Ukraine. The United States is sending 31 of its Abrams battle tanks to Ukraine. President Biden announced the move after Germany's decision to send some of its own Leopard 2 tanks and also allowing other European countries to do the same. Well, delays uh, to that decision by Berlin had put NATO unity under strain, with President Zelensky, you can see him there talking to our own uh, Kay Burley, pushing for more tanks more quickly. President Zelensky was talking to Kay when he found out the German tanks were on the way. Leopard 2 tanks are coming from Europe. You must be relieved. Uh, ah, Scholz, Scholz, Tilke, Scholz. No, u mnie z Scholzem będzie rozmowa zaraz. Prezesekretarz powiedział, że Scholz, Scholz, kanclerz Scholz potwierdził, że da Leopardy. U mnie z zustrzeniem od razu z nim rozmowa po telefonu, od razu pisze naszego interwiu. Ja bardzo rady i chcę podziękować Niemczech. Ja dziękuję Brytanii i dziękuję Spółczynom Stata Ameryki za to, że oni przyjęli takie rzeczy. Ale ja... Вдячний в цілому світу за підтримку України. Але якщо ми говоримо відкрито з вами і чесно, то кількість танків і термін, коли вони можуть до нас доїхати, мають невід'ємну, а важливу роль. Well, let's go live to Washington. We can speak to our US correspondent, uh, Mark Stone. So the US is sending more tanks to Ukraine, but we just heard there President Zelensky saying the delivery time is critical. What is the time frame for this? Uh, months, Sophie. Uh, even the, uh, the best case scenario, which is for the uh, German tanks, or at least the, the German manufactured tanks that may be operated by uh, other Eastern European countries, those will be the first to arrive. Uh, and I'm told from sources here in Washington uh, that the expectation is that they won't arrive for several months. So 
uh, around about the time when the spring offensive, the Russian spring offensive, uh, is expected. As for the American tanks, uh, well, they will be months and months and months away, perhaps even up to a year away. There's no expectation that they will be ready in time for any uh, Russian spring offensive. The reason for that is because the Americans are procuring them. They're not taking them from existing U.S. Army stocks um, for reasons that they haven't gone into. Uh, but I think maybe some of that is going to be to do with um, sophisticated, um, the sophisticated nature of, of these, uh, the most modern version of the M1 Abrams tanks. Uh, they're going to want to provide a different version because there is a concern, as there has been all along, but it is a, a very real concern with tanks which are at the forefront, literally at the front of any battle, that these tanks, if they're damaged, will then end up behind enemy lines and get into the wrong hands. So the American procurement process will be long. They're literally going to the manufacturers, perhaps even going uh, to other countries that they've sold these tanks to in the past to get them back and then to provide them to the Ukrainians. We're talking many, many months for the um, European tanks sooner, uh, but still a long time. Well, wow, up to a year for the US tanks. I mean, that feels like a pretty important footnote, doesn't it? And what about the number as well? Um, yeah. Is it what President Zelensky is after? No, uh, President Zelensky, I mean, throughout this conflict, they've always asked for more than they know they're going to get. Um, and they've also, to be honest, they bake into their requests uh, the, the predictable delays uh, and, uh, and squabbles that we have seen amongst the West uh, over the course of the past week with tanks. We've seen it before. Um, they've asked for 300 tanks. If the numbers come in, the, in what, we, what they say they're going to give, the West, that is, then around about 100 tanks will be available, but in months, uh, in the months ahead and not now. So, so yeah, I mean, the footnotes, uh, the, the nuance uh, below the headline that is tank, Western tanks are going to Ukraine is it's not going to happen uh, for quite some time. And there are many reasons for that, of course. There is the, the, the issues over concern about Russia's red lines, the un Putin's unpredictable red lines, how will he react? Um, there are issues over supply chains as well. The American tank is incredibly sophisticated. It needs a supply chain that stretches all the way back to the United States. That takes time to put in place. Um, so there's an awful lot um, behind uh, the, the headline today that, the, that these tanks are indeed uh, going to, to Ukraine. And I was struck, too, by what President Biden said here at the White House, Sophie. He, he made quite clear, was it pains to point out that the delivery of these tanks uh, is, should not be seen as a threat to Russia proper. Um, they want to counter the Russian narrative that somehow NATO is on the offensive to attack Russia itself. Uh, this is all about defending, NATO, uh, defending Ukrainian uh, territory, so says um, uh, President Biden. The difference is, and this is absolutely key, is that when these tanks are on the battlefield, they will change the nature uh, of the conflict because they are so sophisticated, they're so much better than the Russian tanks. Uh, Ukraine, within its own country, will be go able to go on the offensive in a way it has not done at all uh, throughout this near year-long conflict. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, bringing some important context uh, to the headlines. Mark Stone there. And you can see that interview with Ukrainian President Zelensky in full in the morning on Sky News. That will be from 7am tomorrow morning with Kay Burney. Well, let's get the view from the government here, shall we? A little earlier, I spoke to the Work and Pensions Secretary, Mel Stride, started, of course, by asking about that news that more Western tanks will be sent to Ukraine. Well, very pleased, because this country has led the way, really, and £2.5 billion pounds worth of support last year and a further similar amount to come, and the first country to pledge tanks, Challenger 2s, which will be a very effective resource for the Ukrainians. But we do need to get these, uh, this weaponry over there as quickly as possible. There's a collective effort. The German Leopard tank is very effective, and the Abrams from America will be very effective too. And then, of course, we've got to train up the Ukrainians to be able to use these in double-quick time so they can get them out of the battle, battlefield as fast as possible. And President Zelensky has done an interview with Kay Burley, and mm. he said in it, overall, I'm very thankful to the world for the support for Ukraine. But speaking frankly, the number of tanks and the delivery time to Ukraine is critical. I mean, he obviously thinks that, look, pledging the tanks is the easy bit, but it's mm. getting them over there that's difficult. I mean, how long could it take? Well, as I say, I'm no expert, unfortunately, on how long it will take the Germans or the Americans to get that hardware over there. But clearly, he's absolutely right. This needs to happen at pace if we are to get them into place, not just get them into place, but get the Ukrainians trained up 
on how to use what is, certainly in the case of uh, the Leopard and uh, I think the Abrams is a very sophisticated tank. So there's quite a job to do to train people up to use these. And that's why he's absolutely right. We need to get this stuff over there as quickly as possible. Um, the Kremlin has come back to say these tanks will burn down like all the others. And the Russian embassy in Berlin has reacted to Germany's decision, saying it's an extremely dangerous one and an escalation of the conflict. Well, is there a risk it provokes Russia? Well, Russia has been using this language, of course, right from the beginning of what is an illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine, which has brought huge misery to its people. Um, and we need to really see this through. And uh, we know that the Russians are now looking to recruit hundreds of thousands of additional reserves to bring in uh, as the weather changes we, as we approach the spring. So we've got to be ready for that. So uh, this kind of rhetoric is, is nothing new, I'm afraid, but our resolve must be absolute. I was interested to see Boris Johnson uh, in Ukraine again on Sunday meeting President Zelensky. Mm. How do you feel about the former Prime Minister still being the face of the UK's relationship with Ukraine? Well, he is one part of the UK's uh, face, as you put it. And, of course, I think one has to um, uh, applaud what Boris Johnson uh, did in making sure that our country was right in the vanguard of supporting Ukraine in its darkest hour. We were one of the first countries to step up to the plate. Uh, and, you know, he clearly feels very passionate about this and he's over there lending his, uh, his moral support and so on. He's very close to President Zelensky. So I think that's very positive. And that doesn't detract, of course, from what the government is doing and what this Prime Minister is doing, who is equally committed to making sure that we stand by Ukraine and its people. Um, I'm interested to talk to you about your brief, but just before mm. we do, um, the Prime Minister's asked his new ethics advisor to investigate whether Nadine Zahawi broke the ministerial code. How long do you expect that to take? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that they won't and he won't want to hang around, albeit that he will want to be very thorough. So we're talking he will weeks, want to come. weeks rather than months. I, I really be... don't know, but I, 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 I think in, in, in a reasonable period of time. I think this is something that one way or another we need to have closure on. The Prime Minister will want to know all the facts so that when he gets those facts, he's in a position to take a decision, whatever that may be. Mm. Um, but we, we do need to uh, leave uh, the, the ethics advisor to do his work and make sure that it is thorough and that all the facts are presented to the Prime Minister. That's the you most important. You say there um, about the Prime Minister taking the decision. Mm. So if Laurie Magnus uh, finds that Nadim Zahawi did breach the ministerial code, will Rishi Sunak sack him? I think that would be a very difficult finding, but I can't, and it wouldn't be right for me to attempt to prejudge the outcome of this based on mm. hypotheticals. We don't know what the findings will be, and until we do, I think we have to wait for those to come forward and then wait to decide uh, to see what the, the Prime Minister decides. When you say difficult finding, what, what do you mean by difficult finding? Well, clearly no minister would want to be in a position where they're found to be in breach of the ministerial code, but as to the consequences of any particular outcomes, A, I can't mm. predict what those would be and it would be wrong for me to speculate, and B, it wouldn't be right for me to try and prejudge the Prime sure. Minister's decisions sure. based on theoretical outcomes which I guess the occurred. difficulty is that, you know, we're being asked to be quiet until the inquiry uh, reports. We don't know how long that's going to be. Mm. And also for public confidence in the inquiry, surely it's important to say that everything is on the table, that if he's found a breach of the code, then there'll be consequences. Well, well as I say, Sophie, I, I, I'm not in a position to start speculating as to what may or may not be established. But I think the Prime Minister is doing exactly the right thing, which was when he became a, aware of additional information that wasn't available to him at the time that he appointed Nadeem Zahawi to the Cabinet, he took prompt action in appointing his advisor and asking him to establish the facts. Mm. And that's what that advisor mm. will do. We shouldn't rush him uh, in, in that endeavour because the most important thing is that it's done thoroughly. But I know that the Prime Minister will then look at those facts very carefully and decide what he decides to do. I think it would be, would you agree, it would be difficult if, as you say, difficult, uh, if the inquiry does find a breach of the code for the Prime Minister to allow Nadeem Zahar to stay in his job? No, I didn't say that. What I said was that if we had a situation where any minister or indeed any parliamentarian of any party finds themselves in a position where they breached the uh, ministerial code, then of course that, that's a difficult situation. But it depends on what it's for and the degree and so on and so forth. But as I say, I come back to the mm. substantial point, which is that we have to let the advisor now carry out his work, 
have a thorough uh, checking of all the facts, presenting those facts to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister then taking his decision. Is there an argument that all high-profile uh, politicians, members of the Cabinet, should publish their tax returns? I don't personally think so, um, because I think there are some things in life which are justifiably uh, private. E I think even if, medical though, records, for example, would be part of that as well. E even um, if, though, you know, so... you, you're the guys deciding how much tax... Everyone mm. else should pay, though. Mm. Is there not a different degree? Well, of there, 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 there is a, a procedure that the cabinet office goes through when the prime minister is forming his or her cabinet, and those kind of issues of propriety and ethics and so on. It's a bit questionable uh, if they're are covered. Uh, well, well, enough. We're getting light well, of yes, I mean, they, well, 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 they are drawn together through a variety of different means, including conversations with the prospective cabinet uh, uh, minister, him or herself. So it is part of a process. So I, I do think those things matter. But do I think that politicians generally should be um, sort of summons to publish all their tax affairs, their financial affairs, one of their um, health um, uh, records or whatever else it may be. I think I think there is a, a limit to what we should expect public figures to... Uh, but others have different views on that. Um, now, there have been a lot of reports this week, talking to you with your uh, ministerial hat on, yeah. about a plan to raise the state retirement age to 68. Mm. What, what's going on? What's the truth? Well, um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is as it has been for some time now, which is that it is my responsibility to look at taking that decision in conjunction with others, looking at the various reports that have been uh, around that issue and taking into account a whole balance of different elements when I come to that de decision, including how long people are expecting to live going forward into the future and how that's changing through time, intergenerational mm -hmm. fairness, impact on different protected groups and so on. Uh, and I will be coming forward with that decision as I'm statutorily required to no later than May of this year. So that's work that I'm actively considering at the moment. Uh, according to these reports, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, wants to bring the retirement age uh, forward. Um, sorry, uh, wants to ra raise the uh, retirement age, which makes sense because it means that, you know, he gets more money in the tre Treasury. Uh, you apparently are worried about the plan, be potentially because of a fall in life expectancy projections which make it politically unfeasible. According to reports, is that your according view? to reports? Whose reports? Well, that's why I'm asking you. Well, I've no idea where this comes from. That's why I'm asking you to try and uh, no, find uh, out the truth. Well, I, uh, as I say, I, I can't say any more. And in fact, it would be totally improper for me to start speculating as to where I might want this to land. Okay. Considering the evidence, um, I've set out the, the basic. I'm going to have one point. more go. One more go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, previous reports have said that people should spend roughly a third of their life retired. Do you think that's that right I think that's one of the metrics, amongst many others, that one considers when looking at this decision. How long do you, would you, is it reasonable for somebody to have uh, later on in life as a proportion of their, expected, their, their life expectancy? But it's only one element of it. And as I say, tempting though, though, though it is, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to start you know, being drawn into okay. specific thoughts. Understood. On that, if that's right. uh, now, when we last spoke, we talked about your efforts to try and get more people back into work. Yeah. Uh, I know that's a big part of what you're uh, doing. Yes. Uh, including the over 50s, many of whom have mm. taken early retirement. Mm. I guess my question is, if you don't have to work, why would you? Well, one of the reasons why people over the age of 50 but below retirement age step out of the workforce is they've taken a calculation that they've got enough assets and income and money to see themselves through, perhaps indeed to the rest of their lives. But what we know is that if you were born in 1970, you've got a reasonable chance of reaching 100 in reasonable health. So I think there is therefore a possibility that some of those that have taken that decision would benefit from additional information. May, so you're saying that they've made the wrong calculation, well, effectively? Well, I think it's important that everybody that makes the calculation does it based on as much information as possible, and they, they go into that with their their eyes open. So I think there may be scope going forward for providing more of that information so people can make a more informed uh, choice. We have actually seen uh, a, a slight decrease in economic inactivity more recently, and uh, a lot of that has been amongst the over 50s, who perhaps are beginning to think about those things, particularly as times have been a bit tougher. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank, thank you. you. Mel Stride uh, talking to me a little earlier. Well, we're joined, as usual, by our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, for his take. We heard there Mel Stride welcoming uh, the extra tanks being sent to Ukraine. Do you think it'll make much of a difference? Um, it's hard to say, for all of the reasons that I thought 
came out extremely clearly in your interview with Mel Stride, it's not clear when they come and what the impact will be. It, it struck me as quite a moment, actually, when Kay Burley was talking to President Zelensky. That was the seemed to be the second that he had it confirmed that these, ta these tanks were coming. And it's a coup for Kay to be over uh, uh, in Ukraine talking to President Zelensky. But what's interesting is he has to keep up momentum mm. because one of the big questions for him just as there's a big question here in Westminster, is how long this grinding conflict go, goes on for. Now, he has to keep up the interest of the West to continue to supply him with the kind of munitions that um, he wants in order to fight the Russians. But also it's a question for Westminster poli policymakers because the duration, the ongoing duration of the war with Russia by Ukraine has an impact on gas supplies and inflation, and that has a knock-on effect on the public finances and how much money that Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak have to spend and, and, and this is all quite a big deal. I want to pick up on his comments on Azim Zahawi as well. I asked him, look, if he's found to be in breach of the code, will he get sacked? And he said that would be a very difficult finding. What did you make of that? I, I, I feel like I sort of know what, what's going to happen. If the ministerial advisor concludes that uh, Nadim Zahawi had to pay back money to HMRC and he was fined, he will be sacked. Mm -hmm. So as it were, those, that's what's been suggested in the media, including by Sky News, if that is verified, he's gone. How long? Well, Mel Stride said to you it'll take a reasonable period of time. I understand that could be up to three weeks. Now, that's mm -hmm. what people around Nadim Zahawi have been suggesting to, to some, which feels an incredible amount of time for something where you should be able to establish the facts pretty quickly. But the bottom line is mm -hmm. nobody, including Rishi Sunak, is defending Nadim Zahawi in public. And I think that's because, providing that there are no surprises in the facts that are out there, He's a goner. Yeah, it did feel that way. I have to say, after speaking to Mel Stride, very cautious uh, person, usually in interviews, uh, saying it would be a very difficult finding. Uh, Sam, always interested to hear uh, your uh, intelligence uh, there. You're watching The Take. We are live here in Westminster. Up next, we are going to be hearing from Labour's Peter Carr. I think that, you know, it's incredibly important that we deal with the issue of climate these days, you know, which is not only to do with the planet, but harming enormous number of people on the planet. And the big question is what we can effectively do. And the biggest resource that normal people have is where their money goes. And our banks, where we're investing our money, are in fact huge investors in fossil fuels, but particularly fossil fuel expansion. So the top, you know, high street banks have given 140 billion to companies that are expanding fossil fuels. And we know that if we're going to keep the temperature down, you can't have expansion, you can't have new things, the banks should be putting all that money into, you know, wonderful renewable uh, energy and affordable housing and all the good things that they could be spending for, but they're not behind our backs they're actually investing in just the things that we all don't want to happen. If you talk to people, they think that banks need to do more. And most people think that the banks shouldn't be investing in fossil fuel expansion. So yeah, we're just trying to forcefully prod, you know, we've got Greenpeace, Save the Children, Emma Thompson, Deborah Meaden, everybody who we wrote to said this sounds absolutely right. The bank should know that their clients want them to be on the side of solving the problem, not sort of sneaking around behind our backs, investing in things which are going to, you know, leave a ghastly situation for our children. I mean, we're just seeing climate change and its tragedies all around us. And we have the power by saying to our banks, let's actually get out of this stuff to really make a decisive change. You know, if you're recycling, if you're throwing away, if you're not using plastic bottles, uh, if you're, you know, all of those things, do this too.
welcome back. It's been a momentous day with that decision by both the US and Germany to send battle tanks to Ukraine, joining the UK, which has pledged 14 Challenger 2 vehicles. But there's been plenty more happening this week as well. Breaking news, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has asked his independent ethics adviser to look into the Nadim Zahawi tax case. You're going to resign, Mr Zahawi. And since I commented on this matter last week, more information has come forward. And that is why I have asked the independent adviser. The very idea um, that he can be discussing and negotiating his own tax affairs with the body that he's supposed to be running. Uh, everybody knows it's wrong. The chairman of the BBC has asked for a review into his own appointment after claims that he helped the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson secure an £800,000 loan. This is a load of complete nonsense, absolute nonsense. He knows absolutely nothing about my personal finances. I can tell you that for 100% for ding-dang sure. This is just another example of the BBC disappearing up its own fundament. We had a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary about avoiding conflict and the perception of conflict, I felt comfortable and I still feel there was no, there was no conflict. The government says it is investigating claims that children seeking asylum in the UK have been abducted from a hotel in Brighton. If one child who was related to one of us in this room went missing, the world would stop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, would. But it in the community would. I represent, a child has gone missing, then five went missing, then a dozen went missing, then 50 went missing, and currently today, 76 are missing and nothing is happening. There's an awful lot of news happening uh, at the minute, uh, lots of stories dominating the agenda, but I did just want to pick up on the very end of the montage that you just saw and the story about the 200 now asylum-seeking children uh, who are missing. We can get Labour's uh, take uh, now with the man you just heard from, the party shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Carl. Um, thank you for coming on the programme today. Um, it's a shocking story, isn't it? Just, just explain what's happening. Well, with two hours' notice, uh, 96 unaccompanied child migrants were placed in a hotel in Hove. The minister said yesterday that th they had special arrangements, that they had special facilities. There was no special facilities there. The children were just left there in very chaotic circumstances. The children did everything that was asked of them. Uh, it's slightly chaotic organisation around them. I contacted Sussex Police, I contacted social services, the council and the Home Office. The only organisation that actually understood the urgency of the safeguarding challenges that was posed by that was Sussex Police, but they didn't have the resources or the power. But I've got to just be really blunt about this. We've always known that children are being coerced into crime. Uh, we know that disadvantaged kids are, uh, mm -hmm. some kids leaving school. We understand county lines operations. Uh, but this has moved on now because criminals, people who are running criminal gangs, will go to where vulnerable children are. Mm -hmm. And they have discovered that there are these hotels housing dozens of children and they are outside, they are in the area, they're in the shops nearby, and they are preying on very vulnerable children. I wanted, uh, and the Labour Party wanted, to get a 10-year uh, sentence for any adult that coerces a child into crime. I tabled that amendment on behalf of the Labour Party and it was voted down by the Tories three years ago. I think we need to revisit this, mm. because what I want to do and what the Labour Party wants to do is to make children repulsive to criminals, because right now they are disposable assets. It's really, um, I mean, you speak very powerfully about it, and, and particularly the case, you know, in your own constituency as well. Um, so I guess, it's, is it part of the criminal networks that we're seeing? You know, obviously we know there's a lot of you know, young Albanians coming to the country, trafficked over by people smugglers, and are they then being picked up effectively by criminal gangs in the UK to what, work in cannabis factories or whatever it is? Well, it doesn't matter what nationality they are, they go for vulnerability. Yeah. So we know that there are certain places where young people who are very vulnerable go to. Sometimes it's pupil referral units, sometimes it's support centres and youth groups for children with certain characteristics. Uh, and we know that criminal gangs have actually focused on some of those areas to try and grab kids and uh, attract kids when they are leaving those areas. Well, there's this new thing now, and these are vulnerable kids who come from abroad, who are unaccompanied, they're in unregulated settings, mm. they are free to go, English is, is not their first language, mm. this is a new culture to them, they are specifically vulnerable, sometimes emotionally extremely vulnerable. I've been inside this hotel many times, mm. I understand and I've met some of these kids, they're emotionally vulnerable, but they are physically vulnerable to predators, to criminal predators, 
uh, to being co coerced into crime. Well, that's why we need to make sure, for example, in this country, if you use a gun as a, as a part of your criminal endeavour, you're going to prison for 10 years, because we have a 10-year sentence for gun use, whatever you're using it for. Mm -hmm. in, but we don't have anything like that for children. So these, these criminals who are coercing children into crime, usually it's in the drugs trade, but for women and young girls in particular, we know it usually ends up in some kind of sex trade as well. Uh, for, if you are an adult who is coercing children into crime in this way, usually you'll get done for the drugs side of it, but you will not get done and prosecuted, usually, mm -hmm. for what you've done to the child. Mm -hmm. And I think what you do to a child when you do this sort of stuff should be the headline crime, and it should be an absolutely such a repugnant crime, it should carry a very heavy sentence. If you are a criminal and you coerce children into criminal enterprise, you should go away for 10 years and you should always have the record of what you've done to a child over your head for the rest of your life. That's a yeah, really important story. We're going to be doing more on it uh, yeah. later on uh, in the programme uh, as well. Um, just to move on to our lead story today, which is the decision by Germany and the US to pledge battle tanks to Ukraine. Uh, we got President Zelensky's reaction to that uh, as he was interviewing with uh, Kay. Now, it comes after the UK was the first Western country to pledge tanks. Do you give the government a bit of credit? We are at least leading the way when it comes to Ukraine. I absolutely do give uh, the government credit for it. We should be leading the way. We have some of the resources and the equipment that's needed and we should be fulsome in the way that we, we do so. Uh, I am really pleased that Germany's got to where it has. Uh, I understand that Germany has a very, very different approach to these issues. This is a very big uh, decision for Germany to take. You know, we have different, we were on different sides of the Second World War. We both have the Second World War imprinted in our culture in very, very different ways. Uh, and I've just pointed out to some people uh, in the past couple of weeks that um, when Nazi Germany invaded, invaded Russia, 27 million Russians died. So in these issues, they, they linger very, very long. There is a lot of baggage that Germany carries, particularly when the discussion comes to being mm. uh, offensive and not defensive in the way that they tackle the defence of their country so, and, and, and use of military. Mm. So I'm pleased they got to where they are. Uh, it's clear that they've been thoughtful uh, and it's clear also they've worked with the US and they've unlocked some uh, investment in tanks from the US as well. So these are all positive things. But we need to see this not as leadership, but partnership. Uh, Britain has been very, very good and fulsome, but we need to realise that if we're going to repel uh, Russia and we're going to keep Russia contained into the future, it can't be one country be perceived as leading. We have to work in unison, both with NATO and other European countries as well. And perhaps as well, being prepared to be in it for the long haul. I thought it was interesting, the Kremlin's response saying, these tanks will burn down just like all the other ones, except they cost a lot and this will fall on the shoulders of European taxpayers. I mean, what would your message be to those European taxpayers? You know, it is an expensive war. It is, but we understand that... Uh, I don't think anybody now truly believes that if Putin did manage to uh, annex all of... or invade and, and occupy all of Ukraine, that he would stop there. Mm -hmm. uh, Moldova uh, is next. Then you know, we're on the border of the European Union with uh, Romania and other countries. None of those countries themselves believe that that's where he would stop. Now, if, you've, if you speak to countries like the Czech Republic uh, or representatives of and Poland, they have very specific living memory of invasions from uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union. So this is felt very pungently there. So we need to make sure that we secure our borders once again. It, it is a good investment. And the, the thing about the, the quote from the Kremlin there is, we're very used to the rhetoric from the Kremlin now. Uh, and we have to take it into that uh, that perspective. Uh, now, Nadim Zahawi, uh, we know, of course, there's going to be an inquiry into whether or not he broke the ministerial code. I thought it was interesting. I asked Mel Stride, uh, what happens if he's found to be in breach? Will Ricky, Rishi Sunak sack him? And he said, I think that would be a very difficult finding, not exactly a rigging endorsement. Do you think there is a possibility that he could stay on in those circumstances? Well, we know that there is a possibility because this is the to Tory party we're talking about. You know, we had uh, Preeti Patel who broke the ministerial code and she wasn't sanctioned in any way, shape or form. We know that other ministers have broken the ministerial code and there's no sanction. So what's happened, and this is the thing that worries me the most about Nadine Zahawi, other than the, the, the issue within its singularity, is the fact that, once again, people are looking on a government and they're looking on a parliament and they're just saying that we're all the same. I mean, I guess what Rishi Sunak would say is that, look, he's a different person to Boris Johnson. You know, the, the examples that you give weren't under his premiership. 
What I want to see is, is action, not words. I mean, what Boris Johnson would have done is exactly the same as Rishi Sunak, by hiring Garrett, Gavin Williamson, putting him in post when everybody knew he was not fit for that office and he wouldn't last long, and he's going. There is now 24 allegations against the Justice Secretary, uh, Dominic Raab. This is according to The Guardian. According so, to The yeah. Guardian, yeah, th th this evening. You know, and that's rumbling on. Then we have the issues with Suella Braverman, sacked, uh, and then rehired six days later. You know, no other... This is unrecognisable to any other walk of life than what we're seeing here. It's unrecognisable to me in the Labour Party. This is one... This is only recognisable behaviour in one part of our politi political uh, landscape, and that's the Tory party. Well, we'll have a look. We'll have to find out uh, what does happen uh, and, of course, don't want to prejudge the report's uh, findings. Thanks very much. Really interesting to talk to you Thanks. today. Peace, Khan. You're watching uh, The Take. We are live for you in Westminster this evening. Up next, we're going to take a closer look at today's Prime Minister's questions. back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Now time to take a closer look at this lunchtime's Prime Minister's questions now. As you can imagine, the PM took plenty of incoming fire from Keir Starmer over Nadim Zahawi's taxes. Sky's Ali Fortescue has been taking a look at all the action from the Commons. PMQ's Unwrapped is next. 
It was billed as a box office PMQs, a moment of political peril for a PM defending a cabinet minister under fire. But instead, the hall fell silent as a Labour leader opened with a question about the murder of Zara Alina. Opportunities were missed by the probation service that could have prevented this attack and saved her life. Does the Prime Minister accept those findings? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, this was a truly terrible crime. And as the Chief Inspector has found the failings in this case, and indeed others were serious and indeed unacceptable. But it was a PMQs of two halves. The mood turned and the noise in the chamber returned as a Labour leader moved to Nadim Zahawi's tax affairs. Does the Prime Minister agree that any politician who seeks to avoid the taxes they owe in this country is not fit to be in charge of taxpayer money. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to make my position on this matter completely clear to the House. What was really interesting was a contrast with last week, where the PM tried to brush the controversy aside. My honourable friend has already addressed this matter in full, and that's nothing more that I can add. Rishi Sunak defending Nadeem Zahawi, but listen to him this week. The issues in question occurred before I was Prime Minister. <laughs> with regard to the appointment of the Minister without portfolio, the usual appointments process was followed. No issues, no issues were raised with me. No defence whatsoever for his Cabinet colleague this week. Instead, Rishi Sunak effectively said he's not to blame for whatever happens next. What Keir Starmer wants to do is make this not just about Nadeem Zahawi, but Rishi Sunak himself. The Labour leader again pushed the attack that the PM is weak. His failure to sack him, when the whole country can see what's going on, shows how hopelessly weak he is. Is he starting to wonder if this job is just too big for him? And Rishi Sunak also fell back onto old attack lines, with yet another reference to Keir Starmer's predecessor. When I disagreed fundamentally with the previous Prime Minister, I resigned from the government. But for four, but for four, but for four long years, he sat next to the member for Islington North. And as the front benches became more animated... I know he reads from these prepared sheets, but he should listen to what I actually say. Look at Labour here, accusing the PM of not reading his own notes. Then came another personal swipe from the SNP's Stephen Flynn. What advice would he have for individuals seeking to protect their personal finances? Should they seek out a future chair of the BBC to help secure an £800,000 loan? Should they set up a trust in Gibraltar and hope that HMRC simply don't notice? Or should they do as others have done and simply apply for non-dom status? Yeah. There were familiar insults, but no real killer blow. On a day like today, the PM's team will be pleased that more damage wasn't inflicted and hope that some of the heat in the Zahawi row may have passed for now. Ali Fortescue there uh, talking about the latest action at Prime Minister's Questions. Uh, well, next, let's return to the plights of 200 children, uh, asylum-seeking children that we were speaking about earlier with Peter Carl, unaccompanied minors seeking asylum in this country that have been housed in hotels and have gone missing. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Dame Sarah Thornton, who spent 30 years in the police and she was Chief Constable of Thames Valley. She was also appointed by Theresa May to be the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner. And I started by asking her what had happened. Well, we know that organised crime groups will target vulnerable children. And unaccompanied asylum-seeking children are vulnerable, they're separated from their families, they may have been traumatised. I think it's clear that the traffickers and the exploiters uh, have been targeting them. They know where they are in the hotels and they're preying on these children. And my, my real fear is that the boys will be locked in cannabis farms. Uh, they may be um, involved in county lines, drug distribution, and the girls may well end up in the sex uh, industry. So there's a real concern about the risk uh, of these uh, children and young people. You know, we've just talked about the numbers involved here, almost 200, and you're talking about the organised crime that they may be falling into. 
I just find it astonishing. It's staggering. How is this only coming to light now? So in fact, I think there are 440 that have been reported missing, of whom 200 uh, are still unaccounted for. That's the real concern. But it does seem to me that government have been given warnings about this, which they appear to have uh, failed to heed. I mean, back in the summer last year, in 2022, the Home Affairs Committee said the placement of children in these hotels, which is unlawful, needed to stop. The Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration also raised the issue back in October. He said the hotels were fine as a crisis response, but it had become a core response and it needed to stop. And then the children's charity, ECPAP, made a report last year when there were 45 missing children. Now there are 440. So the situation has escalated. Children mustn't be placed in these hotels. They need to be properly uh, supported by local authorities and the local authorities need to be funded in order to do so. So actually the answer to my question, why is this only coming to light now, is even more depressing. It has been known for some time, but actually the reality is that no action has been taken. Who does the buck stop with? I'm afraid with? it's just got worse and worse. Who does the buck stop with? Who do you blame? Well, the issue is partly caused by the number of uh, people coming across the channel in small boats. And that clearly overwhelmed uh, Kent County Council. And they said to the government, we can't continue to provide the support uh, that we should provide. And that's why, as an interim measure, as an emergency measure, the Home Office uh, set up these hotels. Uh, but that was 18 months, two years ago. Uh, the law requires local authorities to protect and safeguard children, and that's what needs to happen. Uh, government needs to work with the local authorities and needs to make available adequate funding so they can do it properly. These children are vulnerable. They need to be supported, ideally, I think, in, in foster homes, but certainly in specialist uh, care facilities for them. There's a lot of talk in politics about a so-called hostile environment for people trying to come to the United Kingdom. Do you worry that some of the impact of that has been, I guess, that the system hasn't cared for some of these minors in the way that it should have? I think sometimes when you hear people talk about young Albanian people, it's as if somehow they don't count and they're not the same as our children. You know, the law in this country makes no differentiation between children on the basis of their nationality nor indeed whether they're migrants. So an Albanian uh, child who's 16 years old has all the rights under the Children's Act that a British child would have. And I think we would want to treat children uh, in that way and not differentiate in the way that appears to be happening. Um, thank you for some you know, really powerful words uh, on this case. It's something that you know, I'm very pleased that we've been able to highlight on the programme today. And um, if I may, I did just want to talk about the death of Zara Alina. Now, Zara is the law graduate who was brutally murdered walking home in a random attack. Now, it's come to light that her killer was wrongly assessed as medium risk and opportunities were missed that could have saved her life. What state is the probation service currently in? Can I just say that, I, you know, an absolutely horrific murder in my Heart goes out to the family and friends of, of Zara. Um, but I was interested when reading about this case that the Chief Inspector of Probation talked about systemic issues in the probation service. Um, not only were there substantial delays in the case being reviewed, it was then given to uh, a newly qualified probation officer who uh, assessed the cases as medium. And then after he'd been released from prison, um, he repeatedly breached his licence conditions and a recall uh, was uh, made for him to be recalled to prison. But unfortunately, uh, Zara was murdered before that could happen. And I think it just points out the fact that if we are going to release people on licence uh, before the end of their sentence, then we need a probation service that is properly equipped and funded and resourced to ensure that the public can be properly and adequately protected, because clearly in this case, Zara was not protected. So do you think that the probation service isn't being properly funded and resourced right now? I think that's certainly the case. Um, in the time when I was a police officer, there were reforms of the probation service, which just appeared to reduce its capacity and capability 
to do the job that the staff in the organisation wanted to do. And this case, um, I've heard um, people interviewed from the probation service who talk about massive caseloads and how on earth can a probation officer do their job properly if they're being asked to supervise many, many cases. Uh, and then when it's not adequately resourced, these awful things happen, uh, as happened to Zara Ravina. Yeah, that's certainly, uh, we've certainly seen the worst possible consequences of that with her case. There's been a lot of discussion about culture in the police. I just wonder, as someone, you know, who've obviously been involved in the police uh, in your time, uh, the Commissioner, Mark Rowley, is saying that two or three Met Police officers every week expected to be appearing in court on criminal charges. Is the culture rotten? So I think we've all been horrified by recent cases. Um, and it does raise serious questions about the culture because I think you can't keep on saying it's just one bad apple, it's another bad apple. And I do think that uh, Sir Mark Rowley has got a huge challenge on his hands. He needs to be absolutely fearless and robust in rooting out those people who should not be police officers. But his challenge, of course, is he's got to do that at the same time as maintaining the morale of all the decent officers who are committed to public service. And he's also got to have an eye on thinking about who are we going to recruit in the future? We want to have a police service which people want to join so they too can help protect the public and serve the public. Did you witness any of this kind of bad behaviour, I guess, in your time in the police? When I was first a constable, but that's nearly 40 years ago, there was a kind of casual sexism, I guess. So I mean, women got treated differently. You would never, ever post two women in a patrol car together. And that was kind of institutionalised. Uh, things have moved on a long way. And I always used to say, and it's seven years since I left the police uh, service in terms of a police force, um, by the time you were a chief constable, uh, it would take a very brave person to be directly and openly sexist towards you. So I, you know, towards the end of my service, it wasn't an issue, but for sure, 30, 40 years ago, um, it was part of the system. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, I know it's a very different culture, but certainly in Westminster as well, like everything that I've experienced has been right at the beginning of my career, uh, where I guess people uh, treat women very differently uh, in the different roles that they hold. Uh, it's been really interesting to talk. Thank you so much for giving your view on a range of subjects today. We appreciate it. Uh, well, we've covered lots of stuff on the uh, programme today, a whole range of topics, uh, but we've got uh, Sam Coates with us. And I thought what we might do at the end is something we haven't done for a little while, which is to take the temperature of politics right now, because it feels like there's been an awful lot of stuff that's happened. And I'm just quite intrigued to see if it's having any impact on the polls. What is the current state of play, Sam? Well, as we always do, we're going to look at the polls using a poll that's in the news at the moment, which is YouGov. <laughs> Because of that, of course, were the shares from Nettings of Harwick that went into the trust that's the heart of the uh, row. Uh, so let's bring up where the polls are right at the moment. And here we are, hopefully. The suspense. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Labour having a commanding lead. 47% of people say that they would vote Labour in a general election tomorrow. 25% say they would vote Conservatives. Now, we are getting close to 50%. Now, that's, that's quite close to quite an important milestone. At the moment, other parties don't need to look on. You need the Lib Dem number to be a little bit higher to get a kind of landslide. Worth pointing out a couple of facts. The um, twice as many Conservative voters from 2019 say so they now don't know and we'll switch the switch to Labour. That's a one thing that the Tories still to have hang, ha, hang on to, that there are large numbers of don't knows. But the trend, look at the next slide, is absolutely dreadful for the Conservatives. Here you have the Conservatives winning the election and you see this blue line ultimately crossing there uh, at the end of 2021. Uh, and now Rishi Sunak came into Downing Street here in November and there has been no bounce. There has been no bounce. There's been uh, uh, Labour holding steady all the way through uh, since. And I think at this point, really, uh, what you haven't seen is the Tories taking off this mm -hmm. year. Now, the, the other thing that Tories point to is our next slide, and that is the leader figures. And it, and it has seen uh, Boris Johnson, when he was leader, uh, overtaking Keir Starmer at points. But again, you've got Rishi Sunak going in the wrong direction, Keir Starmer going in the, in the right direction. Rishi Sunak hasn't managed to get momentum. He had a big announcement last week, 111 projects, £2.1 billion. Pounds. That was the levelling up fund. That bike fired in Seek Belt Gate, roused with Tory MPs. What can they do that's right? They're mired in sleaze allegations. They're mired in scandal. At some point, they've got to even the score. Tory MPs are looking at these numbers, looking at all the other polling that we've got and going, when's it going to get better? 
What do you think, how far, very quickly, how far do you think they could go, these disgruntled Tory MPs? Or is this it to the next election? Um, there is no point in changing leader before the next election, so all they can do is grumble, and many of them don't like Rishi Sunak, so they probably will. And lots of grumbling, uh, probably not exactly uh, what Rishi Sunak uh, needs uh, if he is to try and turn uh, some of these uh, numbers around. As Sam says, really moving in the wrong uh, direction there uh, for Rishi Sunak. Thanks very much, Sam. Always good to uh, chat to you and get your uh, take. Well, it's been a really busy uh, week uh, for us. Uh, that news, of course, the headline news uh, from President Zelensky uh, in his interview uh, with uh, Kay Burley, which will be shown uh, tomorrow morning at 7am uh, for that full uh, interview. Thanks very much for watching. We are going to be back next week and every week, Wednesdays at 9pm. Next up, it's Sky News at 10. Thanks for watching.